Uh, my name is Colin Schwartz. I am an enterprise web architect specializing in Drupal. I'm an independent contractor. Uh, Colin, C-O-L-A-N on Drupal.org. I've been doing this a very long time. It's almost 10 years now. Uh, so I do a lot of work on Drupal.org. I've contributed to over 30 modules, and I maintain about 20. Uh, has anyone heard of Views? The Views module? OK, I'm a maintainer for Views, uh, amongst other things. OK, so what do we mean by performance? So I guess the short definition would be basically uh, making web pages load fast on a Drupal site. Drupal on its own, out of the box, is not very performant. So there are generally a bunch of things you have to do if you wanted to get, to get it to move faster. So there's several ways we can improve it. Now the thing to be aware of is not to take all these options and things on the checklist and go and install them, run them all, do everything. Because you're, you're adding unnecessary complexity. Basically, you're, you're going to have to do a lot more maintenance, and you're going to have a lot more new features you're going to have to manage, and you're going to have to do a lot of debugging. Uh, because when you run into a problem, you have a really complex system, it's going to be really hard to nail down where that's coming from. So generally, the process is as follows. You've got your website, and you're ultimately asking, is it currently fast enough on this page, on this site, whatever? Uh, if it is, great. You're done. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you later. No. The, so assuming it isn't, uh, then you would find your biggest bottleneck. You have to figure out what the problem is that you're dealing with foremostly and whittle that down. So fix that. Then go back to the beginning. Is it fast enough now? If not, you deal with the next problem. You don't just try and solve everything at once. So generally, you want to stay on top of what your site's doing, what the architecture is. So some questions to ask is, have you looked at the status page? So often I'll go onto a client site, and you go to the status page, and for everybody that isn't colorblind, the problems are all bright red. So you're going to see things like you know security updates are needed, or this module isn't conf configured incorrectly, that sort of thing. So you want to make sure generally that everything's green. You don't have any major problems on your status page. Uh, you want to look at your log files. Another common problem is people don't look at them at all. So you're going to be in a situation where the log files are filling up with all kinds of errors uh, because developers aren't tailing the log as they develop. So they don't know that they're actually creating problems, new bugs, and the log's filling up with errors, then you can't see when serious problems are showing up. And the answer might be there, but if you don't read it, you're not going to know. Uh, then certain pages, are they slow? Are certain pages faster than others? Uh, say, you know, it's a views page. Maybe you need to work on your view a little bit. Or custom code isn't working properly, but other pages are fine. Uh, time of day is an issue. Uh, and there's one case I've seen a bunch of times, which I will get to in a second. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, external services. If your site is heavily dependent on, say, I don't know, Facebook API or Twitter, any of these types of things, and for example, and let's say those services are down, then your page isn't going to load until that times out, and that could be two minutes. So do you really want your users waiting two minutes to, for a page to load? I don't think so. You really need to make that short. OK, so for an example, let's look at some examples. Um, say your site, uh, the first time you hit the site during the day, it's really slow, but fine after that. Uh, what's happening there is a cron problem. So Drupal ships with this functionality uh, that, so a bit of backstory. In Drupal 6, we had a, a module called Poor Man's Cron. And what that did was, if you didn't have cron set up properly on your operating system, that would run cron.php, uh, which is all your Drupal uh, tasks that run periodically, then it would, after a certain amount of time, if cron hadn't been run, it would run it whenever a user hit your site. So if nobody accesses your site at night, and in the morning a new user goes to hit it, they're going to be waiting two, three minutes, depending on however long it takes all your cron jobs to run. So that's really bad. So unfortunately, Drupal, ship, Drupal 7 ships that way. That should be turned off, and then you should run cron properly with your, within your operating system to run that cron job. You can do it through Drush or whatever. Just make sure you turn off the default functionality. 
that's a big performance hit for whoever's uh, having to run it. Now, let's say you've got a lot of images or videos. Uh, you probably don't want to host those locally. You want to get a CDN, Content Delivery Network. Uh, that, that would be a service that you pay for, and you host your items there, and ge they're geographically dispersed, so whoever's closer will get that version of the, of the assets. If, say, your performance drops after clearing caches, then you might want to do something like setting up cache priming or warming, where after cache clears, something goes in and repopulates your cache, so that real users won't have to worry about uh, waiting for that to rebuild. So here's some of the topics I'm going to cover today. Uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of everything. And like I said, some of this is applicable to Drupal 8. But time will tell what and what isn't. <laughs> so one thing I often see on projects where folks that have been working on it aren't too exposed to Drupal is they, they find out that, wow, Drupal has all these contributed modules I can install. So they think it's like an all-you-can-eat salad bar. So just go and start you know, installing a 1,000 modules, and that'll really slow your site down because it's more code to run, more modules that are doing things. Every time a core hook runs, which would fire off different things that the modules implement, it has to run through every single one of those modules. So don't do that. Only keep on modules that you need. Uh, that's a really good thing to be doing. Don't use the core statistics module. It sounds cool, but it's ridiculously slow every time there's a hit. It's going to record data in the database, and you don't want that to happen uh, because that's really going to slow everything down if you're getting a lot of hits at once. Besides, you're probably running Google Analytics anyway, so you don't need the Drupal version. It really does not compare. Uh, another one, the update manager that tells you whether you need to update your modules, don't run that on production. You want your production server to be hosting web pages, not polling Drupal.org all the time to check for updates. So run that on staging or your dev sites. Don't run it on prod. Uh, Site-wide caching. In the admin section, which I'll show you in a second, uh, you're going to see that you know, there are basic options for page caching. Yeah, you want those on. I'll, I'll, I'll get to more details in a second. Uh, other little things like uh, images. Don't use big image files like PNGs or whatever. Try and use JPEGs if you can. Uh, that'll really, because they, they compress really, really well, so less stuff to load. Okay, so this is, if you go to, I think, uh, admin development performance, this is sort of the overall core uh, list of options for uh, performance in D7. So you, you've probably all seen this. If not, take a look at it. Uh, generally, the big cache that really helps is you want to have the page cache on. So cache pages for anonymous users. So any users that hit your site that aren't logged in are going to get cached pages, which really speeds things up. Generally, you want that on. When that may not help you is if you're running a site where pretty much everybody logs in and you don't have too many anonymous users, then you can't rely on that. It's not going to help you. But outside of that, it should be fine. If you've got a brochure site, just turn that on and forget about it. Uh, block cache, same kind of idea, but for blocks instead of pages. So all your blocks that you have will cache the same way for anonymous. Then minimum cache lifetime. So that is, let's say you've got content editors constantly going in and, and changing nodes, editing content. Uh, whatever you set that to, it won't update the cache with that new data um, more often than the amount you specify here. So say people are constantly editing. You've always got, say you're running slash dot on Drupal for some reason, and there's always new content and new comments and everything like that. You'd want to put that higher than, definitely higher than none. So say every minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. Uh, because it would only invalidate the cache that often. It wouldn't constantly be destroying it and rebuilding it, which would really slow things down. Expiration of cached pages is more for external caches. If you're running, say, a web proxy in front, like Varnish or something like that, or Nginx even, that'll do that stuff, um, it needs to know how often to go back to your actual site and grab the data instead of just continuing to serve what it has already. So you also want that to be non-zero, too, if you have external caches. And it's not even um, server-side stuff. It's even like uh, user browser caches. So like Chrome, Firefox. By default, that'll cache certain pages and elements. So this uh, should be informing that as well. So yeah, you want that higher than nothing for sure. Uh, what these ones do, generally you want all these on. It's basically compressing your CSS and JS files and combining them. So you might have 200. On Drupal sites, you can have a lot. It'll put them into one file, and it'll compress it. 
So unless you have a specific reason to turn these off, like it conflicts with a mod another module, you generally want that stuff on as well. Another common problem I've seen uh, is lack of views caching. So when you set up views, you're developing, uh, you get to work problems like, wow, I'm done, I don't need to do anymore, and then you forget about it. Um, all views displays have caching options. So there are the global options. Uh, that, that's the one that just, you go to the advanced section and it'll just say, I think, uh, caching. And so you go to that and then it'll be time-based, which is the only one that's built in. So what that'll do is it'll rebuild your view every X minutes, whatever you specify. Uh, like it'll validate the cache after that amount of time and rebuild it. So during that amount of time, it won't need to regenerate the view, which is great. However, there's a better one, uh, better contrib module or better option in a contrib module, uh, views content cache. What that does is every time you update the content that a view uses, say you've got a list of nodes, if one of those nodes get updated, then it'll uh, invalidate the cache then and rebuild the view. So it's much more efficient that way. It doesn't do it every X minutes. So use that if you can, that's great. Then there's the block cache. So in views blocks, you can't use this for in pages or anything like that. Um, it can use, views generated blocks can use the core uh, block cache. So that's the thing I mentioned before. Uh, so generally you'd use one or the other, one of the global options or the block cache. Uh, you wouldn't use both. The good thing about the block one is it's more granular. You can do things like cache per user, per role, that kind of stuff. So if you don't want a global option, then you would go with this if it were a block. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other little contrib modules to help out with minor issues, like um, if you're running in ODB, most of us are, that's the MySQL or variant uh, database engine. Uh, if you're doing count queries, they can be slow on big sites. So this will do things like, instead of showing you, okay, you've got five pages, you can, and your pager will say, you know, pages one to five, go to the last one. This will just be next. And then like Drupal.org is using this, I think. Like there's no pages one through five, you know where your end is. It'll just go to the next bunch of, uh, bunch of results. So it'll really speed things up, but you don't know where the end is. So you may have to do that if you're running the issues there. That's an example. Okay, so let's talk about some sysadmin stuff. Uh, I think most people should be at PHP 5.5 by now. So before that, in the old days, which I don't think was that long ago, uh, there were a bunch of what we called PHP accelerators or uh, uh, opcode caches. There was, so APC was a big one. That sort of became more popular. There was another one called eAccelerator. These were sort of add-on plug-in things you would stick onto your PHP to cache the code so it wouldn't have to get run every single time. So after PHP 5.5 and up, that's now built in. They didn't actually use uh, APC. They're using the Zend one, which is, those are the PHP guys, but it's great. You don't even have to worry about turning it on or configuring it. It's just built in. So if you can run PHP 5.5 or higher, then you don't have to worry about opcode caching. Uh, PHP FPM is a different way of running PHP than we traditionally did with Apache. So with a in the old Apache days, when that's all there was, uh, you'd have a module that would run your mod PHP, which would run your PHP and the web server. Uh, what this thing does, uh, PHP FPM and whatnot, it's basically another process that runs, which will handle all of your PHP outside of your web server. So you're not bogging down your web server with PHP stuff. It'll be run in another process completely, which is kind of nice. Uh, could speed things up. Um, I mentioned the old days of Apache. People are still using Apache. Apache is great. A lot of people are switching now to Nginx, which is another web server, which is getting really, really popular. Uh, they're saying, you know, it's sort of a new clean rewrite. It does uh, a bunch of things much quicker. It's not so old. It doesn't have all this baggage. Um, so people are saying it's faster. I haven't seen any really good data on that, so it kind of depends, but feel free to try it. Uh, Nginx, there, you pretty much have to use PHP FDM. That's how it, we do it, and that's great. So no issues there. Uh, Drupal core ships with database logging. So that's your default, you know, view recent log entries, that kind of stuff. That uh, is not super great for performance because there's a database hit every time you record an entry in there. Also, you're filling up your database with log entries, which you probably don't want to do if you're moving your database around between environments. So 
Uh, the syslog module, which is in core, uh, is a better way to do it. It'll send log items, log entries to your operating system, which will use a normal logging process. So you can say, put all your logs in, you know, var log, drupal.log, for example. And then, yeah, you can keep track of it in there. It'll be as part of your operating system logs, kind of nice. And then you can blow away your database table, which has all the old log entries. Solid state drives is another good thing. If, you're, if your ISP or whatever you're using has uses solid state drives, it'll be much faster. Uh, the, that, that's the physical machine itself. Right, I mentioned uh, the poor man's cron, Drupal cron, or the, the built-in cron functionality. Yeah, just turn that off. Go run it through your operating system, set up, you know, et cetera, cron.d, whatever, or using Plesk or whatever, there's a way to access that. Um, all the Drupal hosting companies like Pantheon have a way to uh, run your cron jobs. They give you default options, but you can change that if you need to. At least your cron is a contrib module that will give you more granular control over specific things that cron.php runs. So let's say you want uh, to clear your sessions table every hour because you get a lot of hits, but you don't want to update your solar um, your solar search engine data that often, then you can say, okay, this one will run every five minutes, this will run every day, pardon me, that kind of thing. Otherwise, by default, it just runs everything at the same time whenever you specify. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cache replacement. So by default, uh, Drupal's cache system is just in the SQL database, usually MySQL or whichever variant you're running. Uh, so, uh, that type of database, uh, relational, is not super efficient for, for that type of task. So there are other options now uh, that'll make your cache run a lot faster. Memcache has been really popular where you basically have a cache running in memory instead of on disk in the database. And memory is faster, so that's a good option. A lot of people are using it. Uh, I've heard people talk about file caching. So you're actually using files instead of relational database. I don't know how much faster that is, but that's another option. What's really getting big right now is Redis, which is a specifically, uh, it's, it's an app that's designed specifically for that. It's a key value store, really great for caching. So like Pantheon, a bunch of the other Drupal hosted companies, they're all using Redis. I think with Pantheon, you don't get it by default, but you just get them to turn it on for you and then they will. Okay, so these are a bunch of items which are sort of components in Drupal that you may need to tweak depending on what your site is doing. Everybody's different. Again, don't do all of this. Uh, but these are some things to keep in mind if you run into them. Uh, now, some things I guess you could turn on. So the first one, caching entities with entity cache. Entity cache is a contrib module where it'll cache your entities. So that's, you know, nodes, users. If you've got custom entities, it'll cache that data as opposed to pages, which is the only, and blocks, which is what you get with core. So that's kind of nice. Uh, view modes of entity data can be cached with another module called display cache. So let's say you've got, you know, your teaser and you've got your normal page view. Those are your view modes. This will cache those different variations. Now, has anyone uh, used or played with or been told to improve Google PageSpeed Insight scores? Does anyone, has anyone looked at that? So Google has a service called PageSpeed Insights. You basically point it point that at your site, and it'll give you a score on how fast your site is, what you need to do to fix it. Not Drupal specific, just general web, website stuff. So this is, I've actually got a client right now that doesn't care too much about speeding up specific pages. They just want a higher score. So that's kind of funny. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so if you want to get that up, there are a couple options, which will speed things up anyway. That, that is true. Um, so some of the CSS and JS stuff I talked about in core, like aggregating and compressing those files, that can only do so much. The core functionality is OK, but it's not amazing. So what these modules do is they'll actually improve upon that. So there's um, add vag, as we call it, uh, advanced CSS JS aggregation, or aggregate cache, which is shortened to aggregate cache. That's the short module name. So what those do is actually improve on the core functionality that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first one, add vag, is way more popular. I think 20,000 sites are using it. Aggregate not so much. And also, it's not as being actively developed as AdVag. So you may want to go with AdVag if you're picking one of these. 
So if you're into using panels, I'm not, but for people that are, it has some caching modules too that'll help with that stuff. Images, so um, if you've got, say, a gallery site, which has a lot of images on a page, you don't want to load everything right away because then it's going to take several minutes for the page to load and the user's going to be waiting. Oh, I can't access this, why is it slow? Then you could do something like uh, Image Lazy Loader, which is another contrib module. And what it'll do, as the user is scrolling down, it'll use Ajax to load those dynamically as the user gets there. It won't load everything at once, which is a really good idea for, th for those types of sites. There's something called Fast 404, which will really improve Drupal core's handling of uh, hitting, hitting like pages not found. Uh, yeah, the core way is really inefficient. This will speed that up. If you're getting a lot of 404s, then this is something to think about. Uh, don't keep modules around. Sorry. If you're getting rid of modules, make sure that you remove them from the database. Get rid of them completely because if, they're if it Drupal thinks that they're, they're there and they're not, it's going to take time looking for them. And that's going to have to time out. So make sure you get rid of those. Uh, don't keep that around. There are a couple of tools to help. Missing module and clean missing modules. One will tell you if you have them and another one will get rid of them. So I don't know why they didn't put those into one module. But anyway, I opened a bunch of issues about that and nobody did anything. So, yep. Okay, now, this one's a little bit complicated. If you've got a site which is primarily uh, logged in users, I mentioned like the page caching only works for anonymous and you want to cache some of that stuff, that's a bit trickier. So there's a module called off-cache, which lets you do things like cache certain components of pages and various things for logged in users. But it's non-trivial to set up. There's a lot of coding involved. Uh, but if you're running, say, I don't know, New York Times website or something like that, you're going to want to. So a lot, of, a lot of big websites now, they want to provide incentive for users to create accounts and log in, not just be anonymous, because they, you know, they want them to, you know, because basically w what they want to provide is uh, uh, user-specific content. So they want to provide things that are helpful to actual people that are using the site, not just general, general content. So it would be nice if those people got even faster access and things loaded quicker than people that were anonymous to provide incentive. So, that's been a little bit of a trend, but you need these kind of tools to, to do that. So ESI is something called Edge Side Includes. So it's, it's sort of a web server protocol now on how to do that kind of thing. But like I said, it's pretty tricky. You can look into that if you want. And then Ajax I mentioned briefly, don't load everything at once. Just go out and grab components as you need them um, asynchronously from the back end. OK, so let's get outside of Drupal for a second. External caching. So I mentioned uh, reverse proxy caches like Varnish. So what that does is you've got your web server, and then you've got something else that sits in front of it, which is what the public hits. And that's a cache store. Like It'll cache your pages. And whenever it needs to, it'll go back to your site and actually grab data. So your web server is not handling the load. The caching server is. So that's a really good option if you can do it. Uh, the Varnish is pretty much the de facto standard right now, except for those of you using Nginx or want to, um, I would recommend just using Nginx for everything because it can do proxy caching. It can even do SSL termination. Uh, what that is is if you've got... So Varnish can't do SSL HTTPS, which you should all be running on all your sites. That's another talk for another time. But uh, Varnish can only handle HTTP. So... If you're using that and you want to have secure pages, you need something else to terminate SSL, convert it to HTTP, then go through Varnish, then go to your web server, which is a bit of a pipeline. So the great thing with Nginx is it can do all of this. Because otherwise, you know, you need another tool. I think there's something called Pound, which has SSL termination. So you don't want to run Pound, then Varnish, then Apache. Nginx can do SSL termination, proxy caching, and web serving. So you just run it all through there, one web server, and you're done. So that's what I recommend. You often end up with the cache sandwich that's not anonymous. Yeah. Yeah, the what if yeah. Oh sorry. Oh sorry. Uh oh it's a cache sandwich situation. Right. So yeah, what someone mentioned was a, a cache sandwich or Nginx sandwich where you have a pipeline of web serving type applications. Um 
which isn't necessary with Nginx because that web server can handle everything. So you don't need to be running you know, an SSL terminator, uh, a proxy cache, and a web server. Okay, so there's some modules that you can use to augment this. So there's a varnish module in Drupal. That'll just basically give you stats on how well varnish is working, your hits, misses. It's kind of more informative. Cache expiration, or the expire module, what that does is, so let's say you clear caches in Drupal. Well, how do you tell varnish, or your proxy cache, that you've cleared those items? You want to clear it out of you know, your external cache as well. So the expire module does that. It does a bunch of things by default, but let's say you wanted to clear something that isn't supported, you can add that functionality. So it's just a way to tell external caches to do exactly what normal Drupal cache clearing does. Now an alternative to this stuff is the boost module. This is basically for sites that are using shared hosting. I don't recommend shared hosting for Drupal. Don't do it unless you really have to. Uh, but if you are, then, and you're stuck with it, then instead of varnish or something, you can use boost. What that'll do is basically convert um, all your web pages into each static HTML. So that'll get served much quicker than running your PHP. But yeah, it's what I call poor man's varnish. It's like if you don't, if you don't have dedicated servers or that sort of thing or your own environment that you control, then you might be stuck with it. Okay, cache warming or priming, I described this a little bit earlier. If you've got a huge amount of stuff to rebuild in your cache, and that's slowing down because the first people that hit it uh, are going to take time for that to generate, then you want to, as soon as you clear your cache, you want to rebuild it uh, automatically right away before anyone hits the site. So it'll be ready when someone comes and tries to grab that data. So there's uh, a drush command, entity cache loader, which will, you run a bunch of drush commands and you tell it exactly, okay, which pages you wanna, you wanna hit. So you can make that as part of your cache clearing rebuilding process. There's also a module called cache warmer, which I think is also a command line tool. I did some work on it years ago, uh, where you basically, yeah, give it a file of pages that you wanted to hit after cache clearing, it'll do that. So those are some options. OK, now some services that you can use. Content delivery networks I mentioned a little bit. You've got a lot of images. You've got a lot of videos. People don't normally take videos and host them on the Drupal site themselves. They put it on YouTube, for example, that kind of thing. So now, uh, if you've got a huge amount of your own content, you don't want to put it on YouTube, you might pay uh, a CDN. There are a bunch. There's like Cloudflare, Mac CDN's another one. Amazon has one, they're, they're, they're all over the place. Akamai, Akamai that's another one. Uh, so these things will handle your sort of big video assets that you don't have to manage yourself. Drupal's not great at that. So outsource that if you can, if you have a lot of it. Uh, monitoring, performance monitoring. New Relic is a service that's great. Um, you can hook it up right to your Pantheon account if that's what you're using for Drupal hosting. That's kind of cool. There was a service that was supposed to launch, and the first time I did this talk, it was supposed to be all the rage, called Project Pass, uh, Performance as a Service. And it was specifically for Drupal. The idea was they would monitor all aspects of your Drupal stack, you know, inside your Drupal site, external, your modules, everything. And it would figure out what you need to do to tweak it. Uh, that thing, I think, never launched. I don't know what the URL is, maybe projectpass.com, but every time I go back there, there's nothing. Like, it hasn't changed, so maybe that died, I don't know. But that was a great idea. <laughs> uh, Blaze Meter is another uh, performance monitoring uh, like testing tool. It's sort of, yeah, you sort of come up with these testing scripts. And then it, it'll tell it you know, how to run, like what sort of testing to do, how to, what to check for. Uh, there's a mod Drupal module which will create that script for you, I think. And it'll take that and run what you need to run in order to check your performance. Now, I've mentioned Drupal hosting providers before. Uh, what I think is a good idea nowadays is not to run your own Drupal infrastructure if you don't have to. Uh, there are a bunch of these Drupal-specific hosting companies which, which provide Drupal that's software as a service or Drupal as a service, where they'll give you your environments, you get production, you get staging, uh, you'll get dev, and the tools to move assets between them really easily. It's a web UI usually. Uh, They'll have everything set up infrastructure-wise that I talked about, so you don't have to worry about it. Like, you don't need to worry about Redis or Varnish or any of that. They'll be running that stuff already. They, and they just optimize it as they need to. New things come out, they start using them. If you can do that, great. Uh, unless you have, I mean, I've had clients that 
for various reasons, they wanted to keep it all behind their firewall. So um, confidential information, that sort of stuff. Or they wanted to talk to other backend systems that they had behind the firewall. They didn't want it to go outside. There's unencrypted traffic between, uh, between various uh, systems, that kind of stuff. So then you might not be able to run one of these. Uh, but if you can, do it. And if you're worried about privacy, like confidential information, uh, all these guys are pretty much in the States or Europe. If you're worried about hosting your data in the States because of privacy, the Patriot Act and PIPIDA Act we have here that sort of conflict with each other and the US government can look at your data anytime, you're not comfortable with that, then maybe you don't want to use any of the US services. Again, that's another whole lecture uh, in Canada. Yeah, so Praxis. So we have an option here for hosting Drupal sets like that in Canada if you want to talk to Guillaume after if you're interested. Uh, what's, sorry, what's it called? Praxis. Praxis. Look up Praxis, talk to Guillaume. That's an option in Canada. Great, fantastic. Uh, let's see. So I've actually got an article I wrote on this list of Drupal specific hosting providers. Take a look at that. I'll post these later. You can get to that link or just go to my website. Uh, and that'll tell you, that'll give you a list. I try to keep that up to date. So some have pros, some have cons. There's some newer ones that don't support Git yet. Then there's like Aqua, for example, that's just really expensive. I don't recommend them. So there, there are a bunch of different options. OK. So there's some contrib modules to help sort of keep track of your checklist or what you may need to look at. There's performance and scalability checklist. Uh, there's performance logging and monitoring. So it'll try to keep track of what your site's doing. Don't run it on production. It'll slow things down. Uh, the Devel module has a great tool called uh, Slow Query Logging. You turn it on, any page you look at, it'll give you a list of queries, database queries that are slow. Pardon me. It'll show you, uh, you can say, like, you know, and it'll be bright red, anything that's more than, say, a second or two. And it'll be in order by, uh, by time. So if a page is really slow, you might want to turn that on and see what the query is that's causing it. Maybe it's a views query, maybe it's another custom module. That, that's really helpful. A non-Drupal non specific tool is XHProf. That's a general PHP profiler. So that'll run through your PHP and basically tell you where is your code spending the most amount of its time. Uh, so that could be Drupal render or whatever, depending on what your site's doing. Uh, if you've got some custom stuff, maybe you'll catch that that's really slow in there. OK, so that's all the ba those are all the basics. Uh, this, I've got a lot of this information as an article on my website, colons.net, C-O-L-A-N-S.net. Uh, you can find details there. I've linked to all the modules, that sort of stuff. Uh, feel free to read it. You don't have to copy down that URL. I am posting these slides. <laughs> you can click on it later. And yeah, this is my information if anyone needs it. I'm on the web. That's my website, LinkedIn, Drupal.org. And yeah, thanks a lot. That's it. Any questions, comments?